Thank you, Melba Rivera Laxton, and I am the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art and Community Projects here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, before we move on with the program, we just wanted to uh, in not only welcome you here, but tell you a little bit about what we have going on at the museum that you all might be interested in. Uh, we just opened two new exhibitions. Uh, one is a, a painting show uh, featuring local artist Roy Rosso. Uh, the stars that guide us, and that's upstairs in the Center Street Gallery. Uh, and we encourage you all to uh, take a moment to go through there once you come back to the museum uh, during the day. We also will have a program with Roy Rosso on February 1st. It's a kind of painting workshop uh, that we will be looking at the harbor and kind of painting what we see um, uh, with some amazing light in that Harbor View Gallery upstairs in our museum. Uh, we also just opened up a new photography show called The Framing, The Domestic Sea. And this features Maine-based artist Jeffrey Beckton, who does these really wonderful layered, large-scale uh, digital photographic collages that speak to New England histories and uh, to climate change and environmental disaster. Uh, and uh, we will have a program next Wednesday uh, that will be featuring uh, a new documentary film called Inundation by um, <clears throat> a Boston Globe uh, reporter uh, about the Seaport District in Boston, climate change, and that will be a conversation with our current show uh, with Jeffrey Beckton. Uh, and as you all will notice in the gallery uh, afterwards when you're uh, enjoying some wine and food, uh, we do have a case that's called the Local Artist Showcase. Now this is something that we've kind of had um, in the past, but in, the, in this year and moving forward, we are going to be uh, having a call out uh, to local artists to submit work uh, to display in there for three months at a time. And so uh, you can keep a lookout on our website um, and it's new, so bear with us as we figure out our different kinds of uh, uh, ways that you can kind of upload your information and photos, uh, but we please encourage you to take a look and keep us in mind if you're ever looking for a place where you want to try and uh, show your work. Uh, and with that, I will pass it on to Brendan Curie, who is the Director of Audience Engagement, uh, to talk a little bit about the New Bedford Light. Uh, thanks. Well, thank you. I'm uh, Brendan Curie. I'm a Director of Audience with the Light. And uh, thank you all for joining us here. This is the 11th meeting of the New Bedford Light Fine Arts Club, and we're happy to be here at the Whaling Museum. Once again, we have an incredible batch of talented artists, as well as our first marquee guest speaker, Madame Poison sculptor John Magnum. We're very excited to have that. Uh, I know I can't wait to hear these unique stories of how these artists discover their passion, what inspires them creatively, and how they make these incredible works of art a reality. So a little bit about of New Bedford Light. We are a free, non-profit, non-partisan online news outlet, and we are dedicated to informing readers about important issues in Greater New Bedford. When we're not tracking down landlords for stories on rising rents, or uncovering what led to the demise of the Star Store, or putting in public records requests about police misconduct, we strive to celebrate the rich cultural, celebrate the cultural richness that makes this area such a special place. And that's what brings us here to the Fine Arts Club. It was inspired by the Detroit Breakfast Fine Arts Club, and we offer a place for artists to gather, share their experiences, and give us all a peek into their process, and of course, sell some art. Everything you see tonight is for sale. That means you can take home anything that stirs your spirit, just talk to the artists after the presentations, and then all transactions have to happen off the premise of the Whaling Museum. Uh, but you're welcome to talk to the artists and express your interest. And uh, then you all have the program, which have the contact info for all the artists' emails and social media and stuff like that, so you can re get a hold of them afterwards. Um, and it's also all on our website, newbedfordlight.org slash fineartsclub. And then we hope you all stick around afterwards in the lobby uh, for what we call the Afterglow, which is just a chance to mingle and talk to other artists one-on-one. -on -one. So now let's welcome our hosts who are talented artists in their own rights. Scott Bishop is a musician, songwriter, and sound sculptor creating music under the name Scape Ghost. His latest release is Basement Scapes Volume 1, a set of nine sonic landscapes. He also curates two ongoing music series, the Seaport Sessions for AHA New Bedford and Unexpected Music. In addition to his music work, Scott hosts and moderates the co-creative sessions and is a contributor to the In Focus podcast for the Artist Index. 
He has a BA in illustration from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Devin Lieben McLaughlin is a multifaceted artist based in New Bedford. He uses an array of styles and mediums in his art, ranging from classical to abstract. Native to South Coast New England, he finds an endless source of inspiration in the surrounding mix of post-industrial cities, rural landscapes, and the Atlantic. Nivet's passion lies in connecting and developing creative communities and cultivating an appreciation for the arts. He is frequently involved in teaching painting workshops and educating individuals through schools, museums, and private instruction. Here is Scott and Nivet. Welcome everybody, welcome to the uh, Fine Art Club. Um, my name is Devin McLaughlin. Um, I'm gonna go over real quick how the night's gonna run. Uh, Scott here is going to be the one that's gonna be out in the crowd, helping everybody uh, if you wanna answer, uh, have any questions that you're gonna ask. Uh, so, uh, tonight, the way that it works is that every artist that comes up is going to have five minutes to present two pieces of work. Uh, their work is gonna be up on the easels and also on the uh, slideshow, so you'll be able to see the pieces as they come up. Uh, the artists should leave time for Q&A if they would like to answer any questions in their five minutes. And attendees can ask by raising their hand. That's when Scott will come around and uh, have uh, the mic handed to you. Please, don't try answering any questions without having the mic nearby. It's going to be hard to hear, and when we record, it's important that everything goes over the mic. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Now, uh, when we're working with this, uh, the artist uh, information is all going to be in your brochure. You can find that underneath each uh, name. So it's going to list their social media all in there. You can contact them directly or meet with the artist at the afterglow at the end. The afterglow is going to be the last 30 minutes that we have, where we have beverages and food out in the lobby after all of the artists present. Um, if you're interested in purchasing, it, uh, purchasing anything, I do want to reiterate, it has to happen off of the premises of the museum. Get your contact information and do that elsewhere. Uh, but I do encourage everybody to talk to the artist, ask them questions, try to get involved, and try to see if there's anything that stirs your spirit a little bit. All right. And without further ado, we're gonna have Kayla come on up. So Kayla. some other stuff, but for the most part, I like watercolor. Um, these are two whales. Um, <laughs> there's the bowhead whale and the sperm whale, that's the further one. Um, they were painted within days of each other. Um, I basically had an image in my head with the sperm whale of the water hitting, you know, th going through, uh, <laughs> light going through the water hitting the whale. Um, and then the bowhead just kind of came after that. Um, basically, uh, when I'm painting, I try to let go as much as I can, so I get some figure, um, you know, so you have an idea of what it is, you know, what the figure is. Um, but then after that, I try and, I guess, let go as much as possible, let myself be led um, by the water, by the colors, just by my, my spirit, um, and, that is, that is what, what comes out. Um, I usually will do maybe two, three washes, not too much um, with all of my paintings. I like them to be done pretty quickly. I hate them hanging around unfinished. Um, let's see. Oh, and then as far as the subject matter, uh, my grandfather, well actually my whole uh, mother side of my family came from the Azores, so um, my mom came over to the U.S. when she was 14 years old, and uh, my grandfather had some experience on whale boats back before they, you know, <laughs> stopped doing that. Um, so I feel really connected with the whales, and um, you know, they have giant hearts, and um, I am a Reiki master, so you know, hearts are a big deal for me. Energy is a big deal. Their heart chakras are huge. They are singers. They, I just, I feel like whales are such a beautiful creature. And I wanted to capture them in a painting. Um, it is very um, filled with my soul. Yeah, so those are my paintings. Um, I don't know what else to say, so I guess I'm just gonna ask if anyone has any questions. 
So I do have a question here. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about how you got involved with art. What, what introduced you to watercolors and helped develop your style as an artist? That's a good question. Um, so I had a hip replacement in uh, like right before the pandemic hit. This is end of January 2020. So wasn't really about, um, able to like get out and move around and I was in a lot of pain. Um, I had a lot of long-term issues with that. Um, so watercolor painting really kind of centered me. Um, it got me out of my pain body and into the painting. That's really the, the best way to describe it. Um, and then it just kind of went from there. I mean, I started painting a lot after that. I was very blocked up for a long time, but after that, um, I had nothing else to do but sit there and paint, so I would do it every day. Um, and there, that's, it kind of developed naturally after that. sacral chakra as I'm saying this, but it's, you know, I'm being, I'm giving birth to, to the images. They, I see them, I need to paint them, and then they're done. I can't stop until they're done. Uh, when do you know when you're completed with work? Um, I know. <laughs> I do know. Um, ah, it's usually... Uh, it's really tough. That's a really tough question. I mean, it's, I don't work with, I feel like if I worked with a different medium, I'm a perfectionist, so I would just sit there with the oil paint, mixing and mixing and mixing, and usually with the watercolor, I try and only stick to two or three washes, just because, you know, I know I have to move on. The image is there, you know, I got what I wanted out of it. That's usually what it is, but I meet my goals. Kayla, I'd like to ask, is, is there any overlap between the different disciplines, art, poetry, Reiki, tarot? Yeah, I mean, sim symbolism, it's the language of the soul. I don't know why that came out, but there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? All right, next. Time. When you say wash, what does that mean? Oh, thanks. So with watercolor, um, you mix pigment with water, um, and then you kind of have a certain amount of time until that dries. Um, and so you, it's kind of like tick tock. You got to get what you want done done, and then it dries, and then you can add to it, but it's going to change it. So there's kind of a if I like it and I'm happy with it, I kind of have to stop myself <coughs> because if I do too much, it won't. Well, I don't know, I'm gonna be happy with it. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Kayla, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, if anybody has any further questions for Kayla, they can talk to you at the, uh, the afterglow that we have. And right now, we're gonna switch over to our next artist, which is gonna be uh, Idia Develz Vieira from Dartmouth. Uh, so we can switch the artwork out now. Scott's gonna help you take the artwork down and put it behind the stage. And Idia, you can come up and grab your stuff. I'll help you put the new stuff.
had to go like way back to when I was a child and knowing that I enjoyed, well first, I lived in Portugal, I was born in Portugal and then, so I didn't have anything to color with, nothing, we were very poor and didn't have anything. But when we came here to America, I had coloring books and crayons and, and I was one of those little kids that had to color in the lines, I couldn't come out of the lines. And then I moved on to do, at that time, paint by numbers was pretty popular, which I see now that it's become popular again, and I used to love to do that. And then I moved to uh, watercolor, pencils, ink, um, charcoal, everything. And when I was in my junior year in high school, um, my parents bought this um, dilapidated fixer-up house. And in that house, they had um, uh, uh, these upright pianos. They had like three of them, which were waterlogged and stuff. But I found that they had ivory keys in there. And so what I did was I took all the ivory keys out and I went to Salt Marshes. I don't know if anybody remembers Salt Marshes, but it used to be a store here downtown. And it was a bookstore, it was an art store, and it was like the best. And I bought a book on how to do swim shots. So I taught myself how to do swim shots. And then after that, I taught myself how to do burn on, um, burning on wood. Went to college, took some art courses, but I ended up actually majoring in nursing, getting my undergrad and graduate in, in nursing. And I was a nurse for almost 42 years. And during that time, I always thought I want to go back to doing to painting and I mean, I did use it in nursing, but I really wanted to go back. So I retired, it's gonna be three years in April, and just before that, I started thinking of all the things I wanted to do, and I definitely wanted to go back to painting. And what I did was I started buying stuff. And so then I retired, worked in the garden for the summer, and then my husband's like, okay, Adia, so you bought all this stuff. So when are you gonna stop painting? And if you don't stop painting, we're gonna sell you our table that we built. So I started looking around and I wanted to do watercolor, but um, unfortunately the class that I had signed up for was canceled. And then I looked at um, Dartmouth Cultural Center and they had an abstract class, which my instructor is right there, Jill, she's gonna be the fourth speaker. And I'm like, oh, well, abstract, I could do that. I could try to learn how to do that. And so I've been doing that, it's, gonna, it's almost um, three years. And then I also took private uh, lessons doing all different types of mediums and stuff, and Devin is my instructor with that. Um, so, to speak a little bit about my paintings, this first painting is, um, I just saw a man on an island, and I called it that. It's acrylic, and what happens is, I am very frugal with my paint, so any leftover paint, I don't like to throw it out or do anything with it, so what happens is I'm usually painting on two or three canvases, if I get stuck, I move to another one, but I have another one on the side, and that's what this one was. I had it on the side, so any leftover paint, if I'm using a palette knife, if I'm using a brush, if I'm using a catalyst, any tools, I would be putting paint on the end. So this one took me like about three months or so. And then the second one is, um, I got my inspiration, all, I got my inspiration with this first one from the color of my living room and my um, hallway. I just love that poppy color and that green color. And the second one, my inspiration from that was, um, we had, my husband and I went to Portugal last year, last March, and I, every place I go, I always buy glasses, as Devin knows, because he likes glasses also, frames. Um, so I got a pair, and then I come back and we went to um, lens crafters to get um, uh, my lenses. And my glasses, they put this thing on my glasses, and I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting, and then it shows up on the computer, and I looked at the computer, I'm like, wow, that would really be a funky kind of painting to do, and so that's what I did. I took pictures of it, I enlarged them, I made them smaller, I played with the, uh, I used a palette knife on that, brush, um, and it was just, it was, um, so it is, um, uh, the colors of it on the face and stuff, I, I colors on it because otherwise it was going to be too stark, too white. It was going to look really kind of weird, I thought. But I just kept on adding and adding. And um, so this is uh, a mixed medium with paper and paint. Does anyone have any questions? We have time for about one question from the crowd if anybody has one. I have a question. Abstract painting uh, seems like would be really difficult 
me to keep going on it. Do you, do you have trouble with uh, finishing your abstracts to the way you like them? No. No? No. <laughs> no. I just, you just keep on going every day. If you don't like what you're doing on this one, you go to another one, or you can just change it. If you don't like something on it, paint over. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Our next artist is going to be. Uh, Lynn Tanner from Onset. We're going to switch the uh, canvas over right now. You're, you're not so obvious. Got a question up here? 
are the people women you know? Um, these ones are not. Uh, these are, I both used uh, reference photos, and um, I go between using reference photos and using reference photos very um, abstractly. Um, these particular ones are. I have a couple I'm working on right now that are much more abstracty. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always a little hesitant because it's like, and, I'm, I, and I'll be honest, it's like one of those things I'm trying to work my way into to, to the people that I know and I love um, because it's like, I, I want to capture, because I know them and I know their personalities, I want to capture those moments, you know, and just and, and be able to express it. And I'm just still, as a new artist, I'm just afraid that I'm, I'm not going to get it the way I want. So I'm just a little bit slower on that one. Hi. So in these paintings, um, did you use beeswax in these? Pictures? Not these ones. These are all acrylic, watercolor, um, inks, um, spray paint. I think that there might actually be a little bit of pastel as well. So yeah, there's not any in beeswax in these ones. But the beeswax is amazing. We were just actually talking about it earlier. All right. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. That was awesome. Our next artist up is going to be Jill Law from Dartmouth, so we're going to do another uh, transition with the art right now. The, the 
rosy colored one happened to be the lodge. It, it told me what to do. You know, it said, this is what we need to do, and it, it led me down the path. And I don't know how else to say it, but it, it just, that's what had to happen. So it happened. And do we have questions for the rest of the crowd? Scott's coming. So, me and my girlfriend had the same reaction when we saw the second painting that was just so big. Did you mean to make a statement by it being such a big canvas? I think a big canvas makes a statement. It's part of what the artist is bringing to you. And I, I believe that we were all really not given a choice, but to be involved in 2020. It just wasn't a choice. People were cut out of work, they were subjected to staying at home. So it was a pretty big deal. So yes, it had to be big. I have done two smaller ones similar to that. I did one when uh, uh, George Floyd was murdered, which is smaller. I thought that was more intimate. And I did another one when uh, Texas uh, overruled Wade versus Wade. And were those also abstracts? Yep. Yes, I, the majority of my work is abstract. I do occasionally do something that's more representational, but it's not my focus area. I don't believe. But I do. I work with pastel, with acrylics, with oils, with resins, just about anything. I do photography and sculpture. So I'm going. My brain explodes with that. Thank you so much, Jill. All right. We have another transition happening right now. It's going to be Isaiah Vitello from New Bedford with two pieces. Switch those over now. Isaiah, um, pardon the pun, but what drew you to color pencil? Uh, I really like simple mediums. Um, as someone who like kind of gets into my head about color theory a lot sometimes, 
working in wet mediums and just kind of fixating on getting the perfect tone is just a lot for me. It, it's something that if I could do it without hyperfixating on it, I would, but having the colors that I have and using them to my best ability really ultimately, the limitations are what make something the way that they are. So I, I just like that. Uh, we're open for questions if anybody has any. So how long did you take on each piece? Uh, on each of these? Um, I, I think working six by six, roughly, depending on the subject matter, I can take anywhere between two and six hours for things that are more intricate. Uh, I believe that both of these were probably around four hours, but like nonstop, just really going at them. Because when I start something, I don't like to break it up. I like to just go, go, go. Because you have ideas and feelings in the moment that might be gone by the time you return to it. What was the story behind the other thing, or the other picture, that one? Uh, this one right here? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I just, I thought since we're at the Whaling Museum, I really wanted to represent how I feel about the current state of our city. That's why this one is actually called The City That Went the World. Um, if you come talk to me later, I'll tell you what the, my uh, explicit symbolism is, uh, but I, I would like everyone to kind of have their own interpretation beforehand. Any other questions? Thank you so much. These are gorgeous pieces. Um, and I do encourage everybody at the end to try looking at the artwork close up. A lot of these showing on the slides are gonna give a good representation, but not perfect representation. So please take a moment to uh, visit the art and take a closer look later. Isaiah, thank you so much for coming up. Thank you. Our next artist is gonna be uh, Margot Colony Mason. And we have two pieces from her as well. Uh, the First of Summer and Red with Blackbird.
Um, but also this is a really important um, species historically and culturally to this area, and I just think that they're also really, really beautiful um, and unique. So this one's called First of Summer. Um, I actually finished it. I was looking back through my pictures today to see the date that I finished it. Um, I finished the painting two days before my second son was born, so I was pretty pregnant um, when I finished this one, and he was born on uh, the solstice. Um, in 2021, so this was the first, my first uh, painting of the summer, although technically it wasn't the summer yet. Um, so that's that uh, painting. Um, this image here is a red-winged blackbird. Um, this is actually, most of it is a print of an original collage that I had made. Um, the original is hanging in my son's room at home. It's about, I think it's five by seven, so it's quite a bit smaller and I had it enlarged at Riverside Prints in, or Riverside Art in Somerset, which is a great local um, framing and print shop and art supply store, if you haven't been there yet. Um, so this, I transitioned out of oil painting a bit the past couple of years um, into more collage work. So I, and I feel like for me it's a lot less stressful and I can add layers. It's almost like, maybe almost like doing an abstract piece but I like to be pretty representational, but I can add, I feel like I'm almost sculpting when I'm doing it, so I like to use um, things with a lot of text on them, so I have leftover, everybody has, I feel like, you know, textbooks from high school or college or grad school in their basement in a box that maybe you're gonna use again someday, um, and then you don't. So I started sort of scavenging through my old books um, and field guides, so I worked as a naturalist for a number of years with lots of field guides and things with wonderful scientific illustrations in them. Um, so I started ripping out pages, putting paint on them, um, I use acrylics, and then I cut them into shapes. So I don't think of cutting something into this bird shape all at once. I cut basically lots of lot, lots and lots of triangles and trapezoids and never circles. I like to have things with edges. And then I sort of piece them together and sculpt it. Um, and then sometimes I'll paint on top of that. I use a glue stick, very, you know, fancy, fancy art supplies um, in my studio. So I glue things together. Sometimes I'll paint on top again, add some more layers. I use pen and ink sometimes. Um, and so a lot of my things, if you come closer, you'll see some older scientific illustrations from the books in there, or there's text. Um, then this one is, it's the bird, and then it's on um, City of New Bedford maps. So if you live in New Bedford, you might recognize some street names that are on the maps um, back there. And then that print is mounted on then some um, graph paper that Riverside was getting rid of, so I scrounged uh, that when I was there getting something, when I was getting it enlarged. Um, that's a long explanation. So the original is in my son's room. I wanted to keep it for him. He always said it, he was like, why is the bird holding a weed whacker? <laughs> um, and so that wasn't my intention to have a, a blackbird holding a weed whacker, but I just thought that was really funny, and so that's in his room. This is a print, um, but I think it's still really lovely. Um, I also sold prints of this um, during 2020 and 2021 to raise money for um, different organizations locally and nationally that focused on environmental and racial justice um, and mental health awareness. So this bird has been around um, many places. Thank you so very much. We have time for about one question if anybody wants to ask. All right, great. So we're gonna move on to uh, John Magnan right now. Thank you so much. John is our guest speaker. Um, his presentation is a slideshow. Uh, and John, you can come up, we'll uh, get you set up for this.
But I gotta tell my fellow artists that I really love that. Uh, I love hearing about all your processes. Certainly I recognize the thought process uh, and I hope you enjoy my process as much as I enjoyed hearing about yours. Um, so let's start with this. <clears throat> Once upon a time, I bought a log. And this is what followed. That's my chain. So I then took the chain, I did a two hour aha night performance straight up the street at a gallery. But I wrapped myself in the chain and sat there for two hours and people would come in and look at me. Uh, what I want to tell you is if you ever get an idea in your head to do something like this, do not cover yourself with baby oil and fireplace ash. <laughs> <laughs> It took my wife about three hours to find the right soap and scrubbing mechanisms to get this stuff off me, and it still took days. <laughs> Don't do it. But the good news is that a vacationing couple came into New Bedford by boat, bought the chain, and sailed off with it. And I never did tell them where the chain had been. <laughs> So it's a, it's a collectible, and like all of you, I create collectibles as one part of my body of work. And uh, this has certainly been collected by my daughter because I gave it to her for her 40th birthday and she had no choice but to collect it. <laughs> and you might have seen this up at No Problemo. As far as I know, it's still sitting up there and, and I think in one of the back rooms. And a lot of my work comes from, ob from real objects. This is a piece of Portuguese bobbin lace that was made by a friend of mine's mother, and I replicated it in, what is that, maple. It's about three feet long. And then my friend Joe gave me a pair of worn out boots that I thought were really fascinating, so I copied them in cherry. And then this cherry stump became a pair of shorts. And of course it had a great big crack down the front so I had to have the fly open with a belt and a, and a buckle. And this oak ring comes from the base of, a, of an oak tree. But I also made books for a while, books inspired books, wooden books. And then since uh, my contemporaries and I are here to sell things, here's some two newly released pieces that are available at Marion Art Center. Uh, this is a infinite loop of a Mobius strip with carved mayflowers. It's about two feet tall. And then these are basically inspired by Constantine Brancusi. Those of you into 20th century sculpture will recognize his sleeping views on the left, which is my interpretation of that, and the other piece on the right, I think, is the Adre. But I also do touring exhibitions. It's kind of a second field where I do a lot of work. Uh, I've done three ex solo exhibitions that have traveled all over the country. One of them was created starting in 1999 when my late wife was diagnosed with advanced stage ovarian cancer. We traveled, I created this exhibit, we traveled around the country for a number of years with, with this exhibit. And when she died in 2006, I continued traveling with the exhibit for another four years. And by that time I had met and married Annie, 
and Annie joined me at the end of the tour. And then when we were offered a permanent home for the exhibit at Fox Chase Cancer Center, we traveled to Philadelphia together and installed it there where you can, it can still be seen today. Shortly after that, I started working on one of my passions, which is economic inequality. Uh, it really gets my blood hot. And uh, I started with, uh, just to show you a few pieces, one of them is uh, my observation of the rest of us next to the ultra, ultra wealthy. It's funny that there was an article in New Bedford Light today about child labor on the, uh, in the fishing industry in New Bedford, because this piece is about the fishing industry in New Bedford. When I was on Center Street with a the gallery there, there were these high-end cars that were parked up and down Center Street, and they had these beautiful Michelin M4 tires on them. And they were, the cars were owned by fish traders who walked up and down the street um, on their cell phones, moving fish in the bed for catch all over the country. And then I'd go out running, and I'd see people on bicycles going to the fish packing plants. They were working on the same fish but in a gallery, I put the bicycle tracks up to the tires because it's catch me if you can. And is it possible for those on the bicycles or for those child labor workers to ever catch the Michelin M4 tires? Because those people are part of the working poor. There are those who have two or three jobs. They can still barely make ends meet if at all. So I did this piece, well, I call them the invisible and waiting. And what it is, is 1,100 water bottles on the wall, each filled with sawdust. Different colored sawdust, so it writes out the working poor. And it continued from there. More recently, I did this exhibit, which covered a broader range of socioeconomic issues than just economic inequality. For example, I used the Spider-Man image to address childhood abuse prevention because Marvel Comics did it 40 years ago where they pu actually published a book, a comic book, telling a story about how Peter Parker, the Spider-Man alter ego, was abused by his uncle. And in the comic book, they told kids what to do if they were inappropriately touched 40 years ago. They were ahead of the game. So this is Peter Parker's pinwheel. The pinwheel is the international symbol for child abuse prevention awareness. Then my environmental statement, cast coal dust, Dr. Doom is a bad guy. But not everything is dim, down and doom and gloom with my work. Uh, this is a, a piece about female empowerment. This, that's uh, five superhero women with Captain Marvel up front, surrounded by other superhero women in a spirit of collaboration and cooperation as my representation of female empowerment because she's not alone. But far and away, my most favorite thing to do is working with a client to help them realize art in a space that's meaningful to them. And I've been very lucky to be able to do that over a dozen times. I'll show you a couple of those. I was called by a couple in West Hartford, Connecticut, who knew my work, obviously, and they said, hey, can you come over? We're gonna completely renovate our, our, uh, our living room, but we're, we want you to redesign the fireplace around. Everything else in the room is gonna go, except for the grandfather clock. That's it, that's what you got to work with. Well, they worked, they lived rather, two blocks away from the governor. All they could talk about was the state of Connecticut and how much they loved it. So I went with an all Connecticut theme, create this fireplace, it's around for them, where the, whoops, That's not it. Where I used the Connecticut State Flower, Mount Laurel, 
the uh, Connecticut Charter Oak, which is an important symbol in Connecticut. And then the, the clock hands came from, or a copy of what was on the face of the clock that they wanted to keep, as were the images of the pheasants. So that tied that room back together to things that they love. As I've already shown you, I've had a long relationship with the Buzzards Bay Coalition, and Mark Rasmussen, their president, called me some, some years ago when Route 18 was being developed and asked me if I could put some sort of an installation in front of the building that would identify their mission. So I came up with this, and probably most of you have seen that down there. Uh, and that was created in cooperation with other people where Horatio's welding in the north end of New Bedford built the, the steel work to my specifications and, and me working with them, and the workers of the city of New Bedford built the bases. So this was a labor of love from all of us. I donated my time, Horatio's donated their labor, the city donated their labor, and uh, a local architect, Catherine Duff, donated her architectural work to for the uh, development of the bases. What you might not know is upstairs in the coalition building is are these fish, which are in the conference room. It's a hundred fish that I carved and put on wire frames so that you have a school of fish going up and down through the skylight of, of the building. And when you sit in the conference room, these fish are over, overhead. And what's always been fun is when the air conditioner comes on, all the fish wiggle. <laughs> Unexpected. And most recently, my wife Annie and I were contracted by the U.S. School of Law to put a complete art exhibit in their newly renovated um, atrium lobby. Uh, I was told that the, they loved the atrium, it was gonna look beautiful, but it didn't have any art in it at all, could we fix that? So after many conversations with students, faculty, and leadership, this is what we came up with, where I did the sculpture of that, the big arc on the wall, and the sculpture on the back wall, and basically any organized all of the rest, including the design of the entry wall, and selecting the paintings that we acquired from UMass graduates to complement my, my sculpture. And there's a close-up of the back wall. So I'm gonna finish with telling you about a project I did with Eli Lilly and Company. I got a call from one of their executives asking me if I would be willing to work with them to come up with a national art project to raise awareness of clinical trials. Well, I have to tell you, I was a little conflicted for a while. Clinical trials, of course, are extremely important by all pharmaceuticals. There's not a medicine that any one of us takes that hasn't been tried on people like you and me to see so they can be developed. But at the same time, it is big pharma. And so I asked them, can we just stick with focusing on the patients? And they said, absolutely, you will not be involved in our marketing or fundraising or any of that kind of stuff. This is just about getting people involved in clinical trials. I said, okay, that sounds like fun. Let's get to work. So we worked together for two full years. That's all I did for two years and develop these three sculptures, which are, uh, and they started out being in these cities and include artwork from a thousand people from around the country that participated. So Lily documented uh, the whole process in a three-part video. You can see all three parts on my website, but I'm gonna show you part one tonight and that will finish my presentation.
is meaningful when somehow reflecting back to people their own human experience in a way that validates them. Making things by hand is fulfilling. Touching the material, shaping the material, carving for hours on end. I've been asked by Lily to find a way to use art to raise awareness of clinical trials. I was thinking about the bravery of patients in clinical trials, and finally it hit me. I want to do an exhibit about the hero's journey. A clinical trial is its own hero's journey. People that are involved in clinical trials are offering their bodies in one way or another in the hopes of developing a new medicine faster, if not for themselves, then for people that follow. Three large sculptures will represent markers on the journey of the hero. Each of the sculptures will be about eight feet tall. They'll be almost egg-like shapes. We wanted to give patients a voice. We wanted to create a project where they could talk about their experience with their illness and with their involvement in a trial. The entire clinical trial community would be invited to take a block of wood, which I'm gonna call a brick, and to personalize it. Somebody will take this brick, they'll write something on it, they'll draw on it, they'll stick a picture on it, whatever is meaningful to them and then they'll send it back to me to be incorporated in the sculptures. And we're gonna get a thousand of these bricks back from people across the country. When it's finished, it'll be a truly crowdsourced piece of art, and you'll see all of these intimate expressions collected in one place. There are a lot of challenging parts of this project, designing the sculptures, figuring out how I'm gonna actually make them, So we are ready for the truck. These sculptures are pretty heavy and we want them to be lighted. So we've had to design very special bases just for these sculptures. Okay, this is the 32 inch base, right? So let's put that here to unwrap it. These holes are deep. I drilled them as straight as I could, but they might not be right, and it might not actually go onto those bolts.
very cold. It's fantastic to see the plan that we put together back in the spring now actually taking shape. Soon we'll have finished sculptures filled with bricks that have come back from the clinical development community. It's going to be really breathtaking when they come back. These are people, many of them dealing with a serious illness, that are helping develop new medicines, and here's their voice in the sculpture. The public's awareness of clinical trials is very low. If we can get more awareness of clinical trials, we can get new medicines faster. And that's what this is all about.